Welcome, my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson, and I am joined by Duncan Palamortis here for Philosophical Friday. Duncan, welcome to the show, sir. How you doing? Hello, hello. Always good to see you, man. How's yeah, everything? Everything's going going very well. I have no complaints in the world, and uh, I think that gauging from the discussion in greatness village after last week's philosophical friday today we're going to do a follow-up episode on the mirage of initiative or is initiative a mirage um to sort of solidify points and yeah just go back a little bit make some clarifications right yeah no that that, that would be great and and honestly like uh um i've been thinking about this topic uh, a lot uh over the past week i reached out to other high stakes players that I know they're crashers and uh, asked their opinions. I defended your position really heavily. Uh, and uh, the idea, which I think is very important, and this is something that I actually, uh, believe it or not, I'm actually writing right now on a, a book that I wanted to initially title The Other Side, although that sounds a little bit spooky, you know, like not, not that other side, but the, <laughs> other, the other side of the argument, but I'm probably going to name it meta humility, which I think is the underlying concept, is that I have this concept, which I call the compatibility of a disagreement which I think is something that is lacking in conversation, right? I mean, a lot of conversations end up with different conclusions. And usually the result is, oh, the other person is wrong. But to me, that's problematic because unless we can actually understand exactly where we disagree, um, then we have a problem, right? And if the other person is wrong, you should be able to prove it. And the other person should be able to prove it. So if neither of us agree that one of us is wrong, then one of three things should happen, right? Either there is a fallacy somewhere, Right, in the inference, there is a difference in semantics, which happens a lot, or there's a difference in assumptions, right? So it's important to find where the difference is and then be okay with it. That's what I call a compatibility disagreement. Because for example, if you start with the, um, the, the assumption that, you know, uh, broccoli is disgusting, and I say, you know, like broccoli is delicious, uh, we're probably going to reach different conclusions in the end of the day, right? But neither of us are, is wrong, right? So right. That's, that's the part that I'm really striving to find and be able to uh, <laughs> articulate better than you can, and then you can articulate my position better, better than I can. That's that's my goal here. So hopefully we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the fourth thing that can happen is that you know one side's just like whatever and throws their hands up and walks away. <laughs> no, no, we don't want that. No, <laughs> From the don't. conversation, right? That's that's the, like, that's that's the last alternative. And by the way, so I, I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't, don't think I mentioned this last week, but my perspective coming into last week's conversation, I actually did a webinar on poker coaching and was really thinking about poker, the construction of poker as a game. And one of the conclusions that I came to then, which was over a year ago, was that initiative was the heart of poker um, in that a lot of the actions, a lot of the responses, a lot of things stem from initiative. Um, now, gauging off of last week's conversation, my opinion there has shifted over time. Um, but I just wanted to make the point that like, you know, it, initiative is a thing that I, I've invested a lot of energy into. And at one point over a year ago during that webinar, I made the statement that initiative was the heart of poker. Um, so yeah, just want to start there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and opinions do do shift and, and change all the time. Like you know, I've I've, I've gone back and forth myself uh, between you know uh, speaking of initiative, taking the initiative before the flop and trying to play a more passive strategy. Like it's I've, I've gone back and forth there um, more times than I than I can remember. Right? It's uh, it's something that you know it, it's interesting to uh, to, to investigate. Yeah. Um, I, I do have a a point which I think potentially can help us uh, start the conversation. So basically go back, go, go as back as we can. Yep. And, and I wanted to explore that idea of what is truly fundamental uh, to solve the game. So we're gonna start there, like we're gonna make this hypothetical assumption, we're gonna make a, a thought experiment perhaps. Um, we have this hypothetical figure, which I call it a, you know, an omnipotent human being that can do calculations very quickly. Uh, infinitely quickly, in fact, so they can do any calculations they like. 
Why don't we call him Hal? <laughs> For those of you who don't get the inside joke, I actually wrote. Eh, eh, tell us the story, bro. Yeah, he... <laughs> so there was quite the discussion. Duncan wrote a, a reply um, in the discussion where he ran out of characters on Slack. I was, you know, it was past. 9 30 or so for me which meant that i was kind of in la la land nearing bedtime um so wasn't fully aware in reading this very very long message <laughs> but the bones of this how message, long was it how long was it Brad? i don't know what you know what the cap is for characters on slack now i don't actually know the answer to that question <laughs> um <laughs> But, it was legitimate somewhere between a thousand and two thousand words that was supposed to be like you know a, a text reply but <laughs> yeah yeah it, it was enough that we, we could copy and paste it and make an article and generate seo um, benefits from <laughs> from the message um so yeah like how your your computer right. so how now you can go 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 into how right so go, go go to how yeah exactly so i'll go to hell right now um so uh <laughs> So we have this omnipotent being that can solve the game. So the question, the important question is, what are um, the inputs that we need to give them? So um, in order for this uh, entity to actually solve the game, right? I mean, we can call it AI, we can call it HAL. So what does HAL need to know in order to be able to solve the game? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, do you like, it's, it's not necessarily rhetoric. I mean, we can, we can, uh, I mean, already put an answer in there, but you can also tell me what you think. Yeah. I mean, we talked a lot about solvers, I think historically, and you know, there's a lot of math that Hal's going to be crunching within the algorithm. Right. And, and not only they, they're going to, they're going to do a, a lot of math, but it turns out that for example, the only two things that they have access to uh, when the game starts is the position and stack sizes. So as long as HAL has access to position and stack sizes, they can solve the entire game. They don't need to know anything about words like ranges. They don't need to know anything about textures because they will have to uh, basically co calculate all possible um, flops that can come, all possible turns, all co possible reverse. But they do and need to know, they do need the raw materials of the game, how the game correct. works, all the cards, all the you know all, all the different rules just correct. they need th those like basic ingredients have to be there correct exactly all the rules are there so once we have the the rules integrated into them the one thing that is sort of like not necessarily set in stone because the rules are sort of like set in stone but you're absolutely correct are like who has position and what are the stack sizes because these can be different in different situations so the solution that they will come up with how that is is gonna is gonna be different every time now um, why do I think this is important? Because immediately it tells us that in some sense, in some absolute sense, position is more intrinsic than flop texture, for example, right? I mean, a position is more intrinsic than anything, let, let alone an initiative, right? So position is the intrinsic and stack sizes uh, is the, the intrinsic properties, um, pro properties of the game. So okay. is, is that something we agree on? I'll have to think about it. These, okay okay it's Phyllis philosophical Friday so I have to like invest energy into thinking about whether or not I, I agree with this or not I would say that like the fact that there is a flop is intrinsic to the game the textures mm -hmm. themselves you know that's sort of like a, a mass that gets broken down into a bunch mm -hmm. of different chunks um, so like I would say position is there but you know the fact that there's a flop is also true too, right? So like both of those are inherent to the game. Right, but the difference with the flop is that HAL simultaneously, like we're talking about solving the game, right? Sure. Uh, meaning that uh, no cards have been dealt yet, only just the small blind and the big blind. So um, HAL sees all the players and all their positions, all their stacks, and then tells each player how should, like, how should they play their entire strategy. So really it gives them like, you can think- So HAL's not playing here, he's like- supervising guiding the players one way you can think of that is guiding the players or one way you can think of it is like you have multiple hals playing against each other yeah which sure. whichever way is but here's the, the important thing how can actually go and sip coffee and then the cards are being dealt and then automatically the, the moves are being made because he has already decided what he's going to do in every situation okay this is the important part that i'm trying to make it's subtle 
but that's what a solution of a game is. Hal knows, and incidentally, for those who are very picky, knows means he may roll some dice. Like he may, for example, say 70% of the time I'm going to do X and 30% of the time I'm going to do Y. But he has already decided how he's going to roll that dice, when he's going to roll that dice. So everything is determined. Yeah, he so, solved, solved for every single outcome that could possibly happen. Correct, exactly. Yeah. So in, in that sense, in, in that very sense, I say that flop texture is not absolute. Right, it's not absolutely intrinsic because he solved for it. Right, he said no matter what happens, is position intrinsic because he solved for that too. It, it, no, because the position he needed that as an assumption. Like if we change the position, his strategy is going to change. If you change the flop texture, his strategy is going to change though. That's the, the, I think this is the important the important critical part. So that uh, um, here's what we can do. Okay, if the if the flop texture changes. Uh, the flop texture cannot change because the flop hasn't come yet, is basically what I'm trying to say. Sure. We are like he's is is what you know, like mathematicians call a bound variable, right? We're solving for all possible scenarios, right? Okay. It's like it's like it's like flipping uh, flipping a coin. We have to make a decision before the coin flips. Clearly, if heads comes versus tails, we're gonna be either happy or sad, right? Depending on where we bet. But the fact sure, so the matter I, I I I get it. So like pre pre-flop, um basically the the position that Hal is in is the first variable in play here, as well as like all the stack sizes behind Hal and that sort of thing. Correct, exactly. Everything else is like you know, I, I, if, if the flop comes, but it doesn't matter because his strategy has already been determined. It's not going to change. It. So in right, in but, some... but it's like uh, under the gun position doesn't really matter either because he has a he has a pre built strategy for under the gun, and then he has a you know for the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and then the button, the small blind, and the big blind. All all that stuff is already pre built as well, right? Co correct. The only difference is he can solve how to play the under the gun, uh, um, uh, the under the gun strategy. Uh, before uh, he sees the flop. So in some sense, like he can say, you know what, basically what you're doing here, you are, mathematicians will say you will you will quantifying. So you basically solve, let's say nine different games, playing under the gun, playing under the gun plus one and so on. Sure. And, 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 exactly. and then yeah. you say, now, now this is, not a, this is not an input either. And you're correct, mm -hmm. right? But in some sense, you know, we need to do that after we haven't considered the texture as input, if that makes sense. Because when we're taking under the gun as input, then the texture cannot be an input because we have to solve for all of it. So in some sense, the, you're saying uh, it's a, it's like basically the the first domino. Correct. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So the first domino in 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 in, in some sense is is the absolute uh, position and and the in the uh, in the stack sizes. Now we can make this a little bit easier on ourselves, right? And say, you know what? Let's let's forget about what happens pre-flop. Let's actually start solving the game on the flop, right? We can do that too. Right? Okay. That, that, why, that, why 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 did you make it so hard on me in the first place, Duncan? What's it? Because uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> now we're making it easy on me. What, what's happening here? Well, well, first of all, I apologize, but second of all, <laughs> uh, it's uh, because the I, I get it though. I see what I see what you're saying. So yeah, we we can move to the next point here. Right. Right. So the um. The reason why I'm saying all this is because there is some sequence of uh, intrinsic properties, like there's sequence of intrinsicness, if that's even a word, right? So uh, if we go- I think on, it's intrinsicnicity. Intrinsicnicity, very good. Yeah, that, so there is- the <laughs> Interesting necessity. So- <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> it's easy, easy. Language is easy. So uh, how do people ever disagree? I mean, you know, like definitions, <laughs> it's just a piece of cake, like, you know. Yeah, anyway, yeah. so- we're now, we're now, let's say, on the flop, for example, the way solvers are doing it. So now we have to add an extra assumption. And that assumption is flop texture. We also have to force pre-flop ranges. And um, we also have to, again, position still there and stack size is still there. And we can solve the game from there. Now, the subtle point, which is a little bit easier revealed if we solve the game pre-flop as opposed on the flop that I'm trying to make, is that how ultimately does not care about any of these things in some sense, especially, especially texture. All that Hal cares is which of the path in the decision tree, and more precisely, which of the mixed path on the decision tree, for those who want to get technical, is the one that generates the most EV. 
Mm -hmm. So in other words, how it doesn't say I bet, for example, because I have card advantage. It doesn't say I sure. bet because I have equity advantage. Sure. He has equity advantage because he bets. He has range advantage because he bets and so on. So it goes a little bit in reverse. So the causality is a bit in reverse. Right? He says, I bet because that's what the decision tree is telling me to do. I've done all these complicated calculations, all the different paths, and I see I should be zigging versus zagging because if I zig, I make more money. That it's makes- basically like the, the action is just the output. C correct, exactly. The action, the action is the output. Now, how is that potentially, uh, potentially beneficial to us? Um, it shows that none of the heuristics we're using, which is, for example, range advantages, equity advantages, not advantages, and I would argue initiative whether or not we accept it or not, none of that stuff is intrinsic. Really what is intrinsic to the game is position, uh, stack sizes, and then on a second level of interesting dizziness, <laughs> we will have, uh, we will have a, a flop texture and the forced pre-flop ranges, right? So we can put all of these uh, as, as extra inputs. But how never causally, right? This is a, a perfect example where, you know, correlation does not imply causation. The uh, how never causally says, I bet, because of my range advantage, or I bet big because of my range advantage, or I have equity advantage. He never says those things. He just says that's the most profitable, uh, profitable line. Mm -hmm. uh, so where does, but, but wait a minute, uh, you know, uh, we can say like, where is the, uh, I mean, range advantage is so useful, like, you know, equity advantage is so useful. Where do, does all of that come, come into play? I would argue these are our heuristics to actually reverse engineer and approximate Hull's strategy, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we know that there is a perfect strategy. Well, no, go ahead. Yeah. So to, to cut in, like, yes. as I mentioned before, how whatever action Hal takes is an output, right? That is um, effectively dependent on his inputs Correct. and Hal's algorithm and however um, he, he or she comes to each decision Correct. in the game tree which inherently has to do with, you know, the recipe of poker and right. equity and board coverage. And just like a lot of, a lot of concepts, he's not going to call it that, but I mean, that's, if we broke it down into math and communicate it, it to other human beings, that's how it would be communicated um, to how it's just a bunch of raw numbers that he's, you know, bashing in the head and, and finding the right answers. Correct. My, my argument philosophically here is, that yeah. this is what heuristically is what we call the identification of the patterns that we see in his strategy. Okay. So it's a conclusion, not a causal thing, right? So we're saying, oh, listen, we find correlation. We find a lot of correlation between his betting and what we would call um, um, a range advantage, or we find, mm -hmm. find a lot of correlation. So we say, oh, you know what? Here is a pattern, right? So it is a heuristic. It is not causal. It's not that he's betting because he has range advantage. It's because we see a lot of betting when he has, when what we call range advantage, that we say, oh, there's correlation between having range advantage and betting. So heuristically, it's good to think of range advantage, if that makes sense. It does. So this can be useful to us because if we call range advantage or equity advantage a heuristic and not an intrinsic property of the, of the game in the absolute sense, in the absolute sense, we explain what that is, then we can similarly view initiative under the same light, I would argue. And this is where we have to be very careful because I don't want to, uh, as, as people sometimes say, <laughs> I don't want to smuggle Jesus into the conversation. <laughs> I apologize for any, you know, if that's offensive to anybody, but I really don't want to smuggle anything here in the conversation, right? But I, I, I would argue, because I'm, I'm really trying to find where our disagreement is, and you do have a very important point that indeed, initiative is not intrinsic in the absolute sense. The, the one thing I would say though, neither is range advantage in some absolute sense. They're both, I would argue, um, heuristics of patterns that we identify in what we would call the absolute strategy. Sure, and so like, so the, the end goal though is to figure out what action to take, right? Mm -hmm. Given the inputs in to, our brains using our brain computer to figure out what the output ought to be. To approximate, and, uh, to approximate Hal's output, correct. So our goal is to approximate the correct output. What would Hal do, basically, is the question. Yeah, which 
is also dependent on a, a bunch of factors too. Like right. just without getting into like how specifically if how is only starting from the paradigm of like, um, you know, position and stack sizes, then his strategy would shift given more information about the specific opponents that Hal is playing against in order to uh, basically make the most EV if that is Hal's goal. Very good. And I think that point actually is one where we can find a lot of food for thought because there's one more, more and more input we can add to the problem. And that is, we can call it Bobby. We can add to the input Bobby. So instead of Hal now solving what we is known as GTO, Hal can actually add Bobby into the input. So he can say, you know, uh, position, uh, stack sizes plus Bobby, and then solve the game to maximally exploit Bobby. It's going to be the same. It's going to be the same idea. Still, the range advantages are not intrinsic. Still, initiative is not intrinsic. But once again, the perfect way that he plays against Bobby could reveal patterns that can be approximated or they're highly correlated with thinking as if range advantages, uh, not advantages, equity advantages, and initiative are intrinsic mm -hmm. or, or I, I, thinking that they're causal, even though they're, they're not. Yeah. I mean, where, where this kind of breaks down though, is like, we have to communicate these things in some way that's not mm -hmm. speaking in mm -hmm. ones and zeros. Right. So like just right. by the nature of needing to communicate these concepts that are abstract, um, that's where things kind of, you know, that that's where we get away from like the raw ingredients of like what Hal is considering before making decisions because like we have to bunch up these thoughts because else we'll just be sitting in a spot and, and just talk about it for you know 10 years and then finally end our thoughts on the flop and then all of a sudden you know we're somebody that takes 10 years to make one decision I agree. I, I absolutely agree. And that's, you know, heuristics are incredibly important. I mean, humans would do that all the time. Absolutely. hundred percent. Otherwise it will take us forever. And, sure. this, and, 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 and I think perhaps, again, I've been thinking a lot about it. I've talked to, to a lot of my friends, you know, they say, you know, a lot of them are using it heuristically and they don't think about it. And, and I, I push back. I really do, do push back. And, and I think there is a huge difference between the two different inputs. Uh, if we put as, as, as absolute input, position, stack sizes, and nothing else versus position, stack sizes, and Bobby, I think initiative as a heuristic plays two different roles in those two scenarios. And if we call the first situation HAL, GTO HAL versus exploitative HAL, right? So uh, G in, for GTO HAL, uh, I would argue uh, and I think this is the point that I, I, I agree with you. I would argue that GTO Hall cares very little about initiative, even as a heuristic. So GTO Hall, the, the only time that initiative can be a good heuristic, if we identify patterns where GTO Hall has a lot of, let's say, multi-street bets. So he bets and then he bets again and he bets again. So we can say, you know what, I can bet on the next street because I bet on the previous one, because I have initiative, because in quotes, of course, because it's not causal. So we can identify patterns that show some causal, uh, not, not causal, that's just correlation of one bet to the next in the GTO. Yeah. But that should be much rarer than range advantage, I would argue in the GTO sense. Is that something we agree, disagree, thoughts? I'm not sure I'm feeling lost. <laughs> I'm feeling lost, lost in our conversation again this week. I, what? Sorry, I, I got distracted thinking about just thinking about this this whole uh, initiative conundrum. Um, but, but basically, I, I, re, re, restate the question because I, yes, I have yes, yes. some other things to. to no, 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 not a problem. So, um, what what I'm trying to say is that thinking of uh, both initiative and range advantage, let's say, as heuristics, really what it means is we're trying to find correlation between uh, the GTO uh, uh, perfect strategy and situations where we would say, oh, it's uh, Hal is doing it because of range advantage or because of initiative. I'm saying that in a GTO setting, we're not gonna see much because of initiative. We're gonna see more because of range advantage, even though in neither of those situations it's causal. It's not like, we're not gonna find mu much correlation between their betting and uh, initiative. We're gonna find, bigger correlation between betting and range advantage 
although none of these are going to be perfect because again gtos are very weird strategies yeah so i guess going back to the initial premise of the first episode right yeah. is initiative a mirage it sounds like we're in agreement that it is but but here here's here's uh, we're agreement that in 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 gto hall it is on the mirage side yes mm -hmm. But if we go on GTO, uh, sorry, on a HAL exploitable, then when we play against Bobby, I would argue, then now uh, uh, there are situations where initiative becomes a much better heuristic even than range advantage in some scenarios, I would argue. Right? Because again, HAL in that second case is going to try to fully, is going to try to fully exploit Bobby. And because mm -hmm. Bobby, uh, hypothetically, uh, either for psychological reasons, or because we can manipulate Bobby into thinking, him thinking, that we are actually on different parts of the decision tree than we actually are. In other words, we can fool him into thinking that we're stronger than we are because he's Bobby, he's human, you know, like he, he makes mistakes. Uh, and I, we can argue about those mistakes later. I would say we're not like, Hal, Hal is not like fooling. I would say that's just like a human, a human label on Hal since Hal's the computer. Hal's punching holes through the inefficiencies of Bobby's strategy, Agreed. Um, which is tricking Bobby and fooling Bobby, but it, that's not the intention of Hal. He's just poking holes in a very inconsistent and poorly structured strategy. Correct, very good. And again, you, you're revealing the issue, which is the underlying theme of the conversation. Neither, neither of these things are causal. You're essentially saying initiative is not causal. So you're saying that how, and I agree with you 100%, and I think that could be at the core of our, uh, of our discussion. I think it can help us with the conversation, hopefully, that initiative or range advantage are never causal, not in the first case or in the second case. So he's not betting because of initiative. He's betting because he found that Bobby folds a lot in certain situations. But I would argue now that because now Hal in the second scenario bets a lot because Bobby is folding or overfolding, or he's being overly afraid, or he is, you know, confused, or he thinks we're stronger than we are. Whatever the reasons are that that cause Hal to bet, it now creates a nice heuristic for initiative because it turns out heuristically that a lot of the folds that um, that Bobby is making we can tie to the concept that we can call um, uh, we can call initiative in a similar way that a lot of the bets that Hal is making we can tie to the concept that we call range advantage. Okay. That, that's, the, that's the argument. That, that's what I'm saying. It, it, it's subtle. It's not causal, but it's still a good heuristic. Yeah. So initiative is a mirage. That's, that's what I'm hearing here. <laughs> We're... And range advantage is a mirage. Yes. Sure. I, I, yeah. I, okay. Right. Yes. Yeah. No, no. Great. Great. You see, that's, that's the beautiful thing. We can decide to call things them. That's the compatibility that I'm talking about. Yes. Right. Right. So, like, yes. Yeah. I mean, that, that was sort of like where I was getting a little bit confused in, in your side of the argument too, was that um, I didn't, we, we weren't initially speaking about range advantage, right? Like, right. And yeah, I mean, range advantage is a useful heuristic as well. Right. Um, and effectively can be broken down into different parts as it relates to like equity and lines and all of the, all of these things, like just the general components of like what Hal or any solver takes into consideration before spitting out its, you know, strategy. Um, so yeah, like, I'm I'm happy with where where we're at right now. Right? Right. <laughs> that's, the, that's the compatibility I'm talking about, right? It's important, they, right? I mean, we have to. You know, go ahead. Yeah, where where I think where I think we we differ greatly is in um, the value of initiative as a heuristic and just the value of initiative sure. in general. I think you, uh, from my opinion, is that you overvalue initiative, and mm -hmm. I'm I assume your opinion is that I undervalue initiative. Um, not, not until I understand exactly what you mean by it, right? Because it's a very, it's a very difficult concept. Like, I mean, we had to actually really go to the bare minimums of the game to like take it from the beginning and very carefully, like consider different cases. It is a very, very, very complicated, very complicated yeah. concept. And, and also it might be difficult to know sometimes why is it that we're betting? Is it really purely initiative? Is it really range advantage? Is it both? You know, some, is it one more than the other? It's, it's difficult to, to quantify it. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I would say that, like, it is a factor. I guess maybe ask some probing questions to kind of, yeah, like, get, yeah, yeah. 
get to the point of like me, like how I value initiative so that we have something to compare side by side right. to see like where the difference lies. Right. Um, yeah. So, okay, sure. Uh, uh, that's great. So now we can, we can talk about that idea of um, essentially reverse causality, because what we're doing is we're trying again to approximate Hal's perfect strategy. And by the way, this is not a distraction. I, I'm, I'm having, a, I'm going to make a point here. Uh, so we're, we're trying to approximate Hal's uh, uh, a perfect strategy, whether it's a perfect GTO strategy or perfect ex exploitable strategy. And because we cannot really approximate it in reverse, um, we actually, because we have to exactly approximate it in reverse, we have to create a, a, re a reverse causality and then well, say, you know, uh, what are some situations, for example, where by betting we will cause, you know, Bobby, Bobby to fold. And but all of this hinges on Bobby's strategy, right? Yes, and where yes, Bob, yes, yes. Bobby is exploitable. Correct, Maybe Bobby correct. calls every single bet that Hal has ever made, correct. in which case initiative would be Irrelevant. useless right, and correct. also like just not, not, a, not a good thing, right? Like oh, you, you would not want to have initiative with like bad hands mm -hmm. um, if Bobby just calls every single bet, right? So right. a lot of it hinges on how Bobby is going to construct his strategy and then Hal constructs the counter strategy. Uh, correct. And that was a topic we already agreed from last week, 100%, right? I mean, we're talking about, you know, even I'm not a big fan of limping, but I've done it in certain situations where I thought, yeah. thought it was. Yes, absolutely. We agree 100% on that. Now, um, so uh, one way, one, I guess, different way, like a spark by the conversation we, we, we've been having, uh, that I like to think of initiative as, as a heuristic in the context of our conversation is that Still heuristically, um, Hal can, I shouldn't say Hal because Hal is not the one, but us imitating Hal. So let's say Alex is trying to emulate Hal. Alex emulating Hal can actually use initiative in a way to manipulate Bobby into actually thinking that she is on a different part or a different path of the tree or the decision tree than she actually is. So uh, could you say, could you explain what you mean by that? What I mean by that is basically he wants, uh, she wants, Alex wants uh, Bobby to think that she's zigging when she's actually zagging, basically. Mm -hmm. And and basically the idea here is, I'm going to have to give a very silly example once again, but basically the idea is, uh, you know, she, she bets and she has air and then Bobby thinks, well, she hasn't played hand in, in a while. So she gives us credit, she gives her credit, and then he folds, you know, something like, let's say, ace high, which is probably the best hand, something like that. So, which is incidentally the reason why I, you know, I, I brought up the concept that our nothing beats their nothing sort of deal, because that's where I see uh, initiative th uh, thriving. So essentially what that does, although not intrinsic to the game, and although it's just trying to I match a certain pattern that Hal is doing, we give a very concrete and very real useful name, namely that she is manipulating Bobby into thinking that she's on a different part of, uh, of the decision tree. And uh, yeah, I would say what's in, okay. So, so you, you said something there that, that I find interesting yeah. um, in the, in the manipulation thing and in our conversation with influencers, right? We right. talked about how like it would be arrogant to assume that we could influence somebody's behavior. Um, I think that like, instead of, I think of it instead of like Alex is trying to manipulate Bobby, Alex is just capitalizing on the fact that Bobby is overfolding versus her bets. And so Hal, like, Hal is, Hal is. Hal is Hal is capitalizing because Hal has sold the game. Alex has yeah, yeah, Alex, yeah. Well, Alex the approximation, right? And yes. in the in the yes. example that you just gave, right? right. Like right. It, it would be a human construct to be thinking right. in terms of manipulation, right? Um, whereas the reality is is that uh, you know Bobby's just overfolding facing bets, and so Correct. like Alex places bets because bets against Bobby when you don't have anything make money, um, and so like it really doesn't have to be any more complex than that. I agree. I'm with you then. We can call it, you know, instead of initiative, we can call it Alex bets because Bobby folds a lot and he, and right, Alex, right. Yeah. So, what my point is, is that we're making an assumption about Bobby's leak here, being mm -hmm. that Bobby folds too much. And if Bobby called every single time, then the corresponding strategic adjustment um, 
of like leveraging initiative every single time would be poor and Correct. wouldn't wouldn't make money right Correct. which to me to me the way that i look at it is like you're just attacking specific deficiencies in your opponent's game whether it be overcalling or overfolding right. um and when you bet yes you you are using initiative however just because you're using initiative doesn't mean that it's it's always valuable basically is I, my point is that initiative as a heuristic i think it is real however initi initiative is just not always valuable or, or not always the most valuable thing to do i agree 100 percent, 100 percent agree there's, there's nothing to disagree there okay absolutely and and one thing and one thing i, I may add to to all of this it's just it so happens and this is a thesis we can actually talk about it so happens that the majority of people uh in this that, once again, that's why I brought that silly chart in this nothing versus nothing situation, which again has a lot of nuance. I know that has become a little bit of a meme, nuance, sure. LOL, right? So even though there's a lot of nuance, I would argue that this is one of the biggest mistakes that especially amateurs are making. They're not defending their nothingness appropriately, so to speak. And there's a lot of nuance. Did I mention there's nuance? Yes. So, uh, but in general, I think that's where typically initiative thrives, I would say, like against against this chunk of poker players, which is not negligible. Like we're talking a big percentage of poker players, not good poker players, but people who go to the casino and play, like the majority of poker players are recreational. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of recreational players do not defend their nothing correctly. So there is something to be said about taking advantage of that. Yeah, I, I think... While that's also true, I think that there are lots of recreationals that take way too many aggressive actions. Right. And this is just like seeing tons in mass data analysis, right. where when villains start with way too many combos and they have an opportunity to seize initiative, they tend to grab it way too often, right. which leads to over bluffing, which means that them over prioritizing initiative causes them to deploy a losing strategy versus a player who has a strategy built to just bluff catch when versus a player who's taking a bunch of inappropriate aggressive actions. I, I also agree. I mean, yeah. It's one of those oxymorons where, you know, uh, basically I call it the hero complex in some sense. You know, they like to make uh, uh, big folds and uh, big calls at, at the same time or big bluffs. So the, you can have one player who folds a lot on the flop and get the same player that will run an incredible frequency of three battle bluffs. So yeah, I mean, insert, sorry, go ahead. Uh, the, the way that I think about it, uh, I describe it as like a law of complementary strategies mm -hmm. uh, in the Wolf program and with private coaching students where when somebody doesn't understand one piece of strategy, they tend to not be able to understand its opposite. In this case, defense versus initiative on one side and then also initiative itself on the other side. If you don't understand one you don't understand the other like if you don't understand how to play like out of positions in three butt pots as the pfr then you probably don't understand how to play in position uh pots uh, as the preflop caller when facing a three bet because those two situations are related if you know what the out of position player is supposed to do well then you have a good idea of what the in position player is supposed to do and so on and so forth this is an excellent point. And, 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 and not, not only it's an excellent point, but it applies perfectly to the situation we're talking about, right? I mean, because you can have one person who's overly passive on the defending side and then overly aggressive on the attacking side, because again, they don't understand the concept, which means they don't understand one side or the other. Either. Perfect point. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Com complementary strategies. And that also solves that, so, so to speak, conundrum. You know, how can somebody who's so passive, then all of a sudden they're so aggressive? Like sure. you said, uh, complementary, uh, uh, different situations. Uh, the um, one, one more thing that um, so it, 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 it sounds like you know we're compatible. I think at, at this point we're reaching that compatibility, which is, I think it is, it is incredibly it is incredibly important. Uh, one more thing that I wanted I wanted to add. Uh, which uh, is a point that well, actually one of my um, high stakes friend um, told me and he's like immediately that was the first thing that came out of their mouth uh, was, you know, Duncan, I mean, um, you know, I gave the example of the very good example you gave uh, for those who don't remember, uh, we were dis discussing a lot of things uh, last week, one of the things we we're discussing was the seven, six, four flop, uh, nine, six, four, where the turn was a six, 
uh, and then obviously the other position person had uh, the caller had uh, uh, the the you know sort of like the, the range advantage in some sense uh, the, uh, the or the advantage. not advantage or not however advantage, you right. want to yeah, describe you it. Call it right exactly and then the other one that we were discussing uh, was the the hand where uh, we were talking about you know like uh, a check calling uh, out of position uh, without what we would call initiative uh, with a gut shot and things like that and uh, one of their arguments um, was, Duncan, um, we don't have to balance in a situation like this because they don't have enough time to actually construct our ranges. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's a valid point. Uh, one thing that I would, I would add is that, th 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 that made, made me thinking because you said something incredibly important last week, right? You said, Duncan, here's the thing. You suggest, for those of you who don't remember, I suggested either folding with a gadget gotcha there or you know, uh, check raising, because again, like uh, uh, check calling can get us in a world of hurt and trying to uh, balance there, optimize there is gonna be very, very, very difficult. And correctly, you came back and said, Duncan, just because something is difficult, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. <laughs> very correct also. Uh, once again, I remember these arguments because I had to defend your position everywhere. Sure. And I think it's important. So, yeah. um, and then you said, which is very important also, you said, Duncan, listen, if you never check call there, and then the gacha comes in the river, you will never have the nuts, which is also correct. You never have a straight or whatever, which is effectively the nuts. So what I was thinking is, even if we, you know, let's say, raise all of our gut shots, there is no omniscience being knowing that we're raising all of our gut shots there, if you know what I mean. So there is some disconnect between, a practical disconnect between us actually raising all of our gadgets there, even, you know, not having, uh, not having, uh, you know, the river straits, uh, uh, there's some disconnect between these concepts and the fact that nobody can know about it necessarily, or it's going to be hard for some people to, there is yeah. something to be said about that in a live setting, especially, right, where, you know, we do something uh, and, you know. And w so my, my point is like, what if I know many downstream profitable exploits with said gut shot that can exploit villains in position strategy? And I know them because I've They're just motivated. studied all, all the mass data and I understand right. all the inefficiencies that go into the in position player strategy that I can exploit downstream. So like, yeah, we don't necessarily have to have a gut shot when we check call. Um, and we don't necessarily, we aren't even really necessarily striving for balance. Right. Well, my, my point is that just because you check call the flop doesn't mean that you don't have downstream spots where you can um, use initiative to generate folds uh, against this specific opponent, right? Like right. maybe maybe um, they overfold versus turn check raise. Maybe they overfold after turn checks through and you bet. Um, maybe they over bluff going bet, 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 and you can just call flop and check raise the turn. What do you say? You mean right? population tendencies? Just to clarify, who's they? Population tendencies? Population or? tendencies in general, yes. Okay. okay. I mean, in a live setting, you're never going to, the, the guy is absolutely right. You, you never have a sample size of one player to map out even pre flop, much less post flop tendencies, right? right. So all, all you basically have to go on are human populations and human tendencies in these various situations and the inefficiencies related to a generic standard strategy that you can exploit right so for me it was in this exact situation that you're talking about i i can actually measure the ev of calling the flop with a gut shot out of position mm -hmm. um that goes with every single potential turn action that right. gives us a holistic exploitable strategy versus villains that make it to where we don't need to fold or raise the flop with our gut shots, we can call profitably and I can prove it. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's fine. You know, like, and again, if this is the type of nuance that we're talking about, right? I mean, yeah. you're, you're studying a specific spot uh, extensively, and then all of a sudden you don't have to go uh, to a heuristic, or if you will, you're using, you don't have to depend on just a single heuristic. You can use multiple heuristics and mash them together. And then all sure. of a sudden, you know, you can come with a much better strategy to which I agree hundred percent, right? I mean, it's the more time we spend, the better. I mean, what is what is better than initiative? Initiative plus range advantage. What is better than initiative plus range advantage? Initiative plus range advantage plus looking at a bunch of databases. You know, like you keep adding data to, to your analysis, to your heuristics, 
initially the databases are heuristics too, right? Because again, it's a sample sure. of people. Yeah. So we are adding all of that, uh, all of that together. And and and, and, I, and I agree hundred percent. But uh, it's it's but one point. Sorry, go ahead. We, we've so, so like, I just feel like we've moved so far away from the initial point of asking whether or not initiative was a mirage. You know, like we've just gone it feels like we've gone really far away from that initial question to something else that is hard harder for me to quantify um given like the the different jumps in conversation i would argue that we're actually coming much closer because we're actually defining what mirage really is because yeah. i think i think we started with a semantical um i think we started with a semantical uh difference at the beginning sure. right mm -hmm. and now we're just by actually setting it out laying it out we can actually uh we can bypass those things by just being a little bit more concrete. And I think that, um, um, first of all, you made me think about things that I don't usually think. Like for instance, uh, the, uh, the idea of um, whether or not, you know, initiative is intrinsic in a GTO sense is not something that interests me other than academically, right? So you are correct that if we actually talk about GTO how, initiative fails even as a heuristic you know, or best case scenario, it's just minimally important. So mm -hmm. in that sense, we can say it's mirage in that case. But if we're talking about how exploitative how, then now initiative works as a heuristic, which would explain why so many people use it. It doesn't mean it's well, the best. It's exploitative Alex executing Hal's outputs because Hal is not really going to consider initiative either in that case. Oh, okay, here's again where, where definitions fail us. I, I wanted to talk about the two different HALs. That, that, that's actually failure on my part because I, I wanted to call them either HAL 1 and HAL 2. So instead yeah. I call them GTO HAL and exploitative G, uh, HAL. Even, yeah. though, even though causally he's not exploitative, we just wanted to, HAL solves two different problems. One with input position and stack sizes and one with input position, stack sizes and Bobby. And Bobby, right. So I call that HAL exploitative, even though- Yeah. Right, so- And in both cases, initiative is still a mirage. No, no uh, well, we have to go back to what we what we mean by by mirage. You said yourself it's a useful heuristic, right? Yeah. Yes. It, okay. I mean, yes. there there are many useful heuristics that are basically sure. just categorized as language. Sure. Yes. It is. It is. It is right. Exactly. It is a it is a mirage. Uh, but like the what I, what I'm trying to be careful about here is that people will hear that oh it's a mirage so I don't need it. It's in the same way that we can say range advantage is a mirage and equity advantage is a mirage, but they're very useful. So that's that's what I, what I was I, the point that I was trying to make. Yeah, but, you know, but it, it, it needs but, to be dived into like when is initiative useful? When is it not useful? Useful, right? What is the utility yeah. of this specific thing that I can do? What's the utility of a call? What's the utility of a check? What's right. the utility of a bet? Like these are like the concepts that we really need to understand in order to deploy the right tool for the right moment in the right situation against the, the, the right specific opponent. Um, and this is what the point that I was trying to make er, earlier is basically, I, I think that um, from my perspective, you're, 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 you put too much emphasis on initiative as a raw tool and not enough emphasis on the other tools um, that need to be thought about and considered before deploying, right? Which can very easily lead to people just betting inappropriately in all spots across the game tree, if they don't really fully understand when to bet and why they're betting. Um, and then also understand alternatively of like why they should check sometimes and why they should call and why they should check raise and wh why they should call. And that that's really the major, the major crux uh, of what I, what I'm trying to say is like, yeah, it is a heuristic. Um, if it's exploited of how then, as a mirage, yeah, like, but Hal's not thinking about anything other right, than correct. like the raw numbers and, correct. you know, beating the living bejesus out of Bobby. Right. Um, but if somebody's trying to deploy Hal's strategy, then yeah, they'll, they'll think about the, these terms in more abstract language that human beings use. But in the same sense, like initiative is just not always valuable and not always the best tool for each individual job. I absolutely agree. And I just want to like concentrate on one point you say, when you say like, I use it too much, do you mean like the proponents of initiative generally use it too much or me personally as Duncan? I think that you, I think you personally overvalue initiative is what, what I think, or 
maybe you specifically don't overvalue it, but you overvalue it as a teaching tool. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's, that's what I'm trying to understand because I mean, I, I don't know if I've given like, again, we're talking about initiative in isolation yeah. and I have that tendency, right? I have that tendency to actually try to create abstract ideas, to try to simplify them, hopefully not oversimplifying them. The, the but biggest, just be, sorry, yeah, the biggest, ahead. the biggest tell for me is in last week of like raising the button with like deuces right. and then betting like four or five ways on like King six, seven, three. Seven. King right or yeah, yeah. yeah King, you know whatever that the, the exact board board was right that to me is like an improper use of initiative uh pre-flop and the flop um like i i think that spot is more profitable limping with a pocket pair and right. i think the spot is more profitable to not place a bet you know four ways um with a hand that has you know five percent equity basically right um um yeah, 10, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's 5, 10, it doesn't matter. It, makes, it doesn't make a difference. But the, um, the uh, yeah, okay, so I, I see. That, no, that's fair. I, I guess we would, would disagree in how we would, uh, we, we would play that hand. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I, I've asked about this hand a lot of people. Um, like, some people told me, you know, like, Garrett would never, like, over limp uh, the, the button there. Again, I mean, probably some historians will find, you know, either I'm sure that he's limped uh, the button before. I, I mean, I, have I to, mean but... Garrett, Garrett's great, but, like, I don't think he's, like, the end-all, be-all to sure, <laughs> sure. optimal strategy from, from each position, right? No, I'm just trying to find common ground because all, yeah. of, all of my friends are, like, you know, I, mean, I never limp, you know, like, you know. Right. Yeah, it's I mean, like they, they would never do that either. But again, it's different, different strategies, different approaches to the game. But that, that's fair. That's a good, that's a good. So you would play, you would play the, uh, uh, the, what the hand diff differently. Yeah, I, I saw this uh, argument on Twitter. You know, you, you made it a while ago, I think, of like raising deuces versus like mm -hmm. two limps. I think it was a poll, right. actually. And, and Berkey was in there right. making the argument for limping behind two. And like, Berkey is is also a player who's um, very willing to put the money in and very willing to take very aggressive actions and very exploitable actions. And he was like highly advocating for over limping with deuces as well, right? Um, so that that to me is like the major crux of the disagreement is like I I think that and my takeaway from you know that hand and your side of the argument is that you must be overvalued. Like if I I can quantify that limping is better than raising through data analysis. And, you know, I can just see that, which, you know, is a benefit that, you know, I, I can have and you, you can't have playing live poker. Right. Um, then well, once again, if I play close to 2 million hands online, it's not like I don't have. Yeah. Like, well, okay, yeah. a lot of heads up too, though. Right. Which yeah, a lot is, of heads up. Correct. is probably Correct. going to be different than Correct. like six max or, or nine max. Right. Um, I started at six months, but they played a lot of heads up in the end of the, my online yeah, career. Yeah, correct. Right. So, so basically, like we can quantify that one action makes more money than the other, right? Um, or if if I can, then basically my my conclusion would be that I think that you overvalue the properties of an initiative based on this one specific example, right? I have right. no more data points other than this one example that that sure. you shared with me. Um, that I can conclude. Oh, I think Duncan overvalues initiative as a concept. Well, that, that's fair. That, that's very fair. One 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 thing I would say is that actually this uh, sort of like um, utilizes, I guess, the what I would call the full trifecta. You know, the initiative, uh, position, and card advantage. So, like part of the reason why a raise there happens is because of all three things. Of course, position is position. Whether we raise or call, we're not going to lose that. But I think part of the reason why I like the raise is. Because more often than not, I think we at the same time we have we we have the best hand. There's a huge asterisk here. Just because we have the best hand, it doesn't mean it flops well, and that matters too. So just because it's, um, but uh, there is a little bit of uh, card advantage there, which I think is, uh, is is relevant to that decision, and a little bit of initiative. So it's sort of like it's sort of like uh, ties into a broader strategy, which I advocate heavily also also on the book, right? So the the idea of uh, of, of that trifecta, which we can actually again discuss whether that thing is real, you know, trying to be more selective with our uh, preflop holdings and things like that. Um, but uh, it also there are several points here, and it's actually interesting that we're talking about this hand because, like, there is also the other argument. Like, assuming, for example, let me ask you this: if you could see, let's say you're deep, right? I mean, we're talking about because again, cast games usually. I mean, you know, usually we have more than 100 big blinds. I mean, we're mm -hmm. you know, chipping up and stuff like so. 
let's say for the record, we have 150, uh, 200 big blinds. And hypothetically, you see already, you know, the small blind went to the restroom and the big blind has the auto fold motion, right? So mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to be three bed, you know, the, blind, the big blind is not going to. So, and you see like three or four limpers. Do you like limping behind or do you like raising there? I limp with deuces. Interesting. So the reason why I'm asking this is because the, the way I think it is, uh, if we limp, let's say three limpers and then our limp, basically we still have a, we put 20% uh, of that pie. Let's forget about the small blind. It's 20% of the pie, right? One out of five, uh, the three limpers and the blind in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if we want to put 20%, would you rather have like 20% of a small pie or would you rather have 20% of a bigger pie? It doesn't really matter to me. Right. I mean, we'll, we'll... It's what do 20, I mean by that? They're is both that, they're both twenty percent, right? Right, correct, exactly. They're both twenty percent, exactly. So, uh, but if we actually think we're gonna win, let's say twenty five percent of that pie, right? Because we're gonna realize, which means we're gonna get more than twenty percent of that pie, right? So we're probably we're not gonna get twenty percent, which is what we put. We're gonna get twenty five percent because we're gonna over we 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 agree we're gonna over realize. Otherwise, we would just fall. Correct. Um. I'm not sure what you mean by by over realizing in this context. Let, let, let me let me be very careful. So we put 20% of the pot, but we expect to win that pot in the middle. I, I like to think of it as a pie or a pizza. We're not going to win uh, on average all of it because again, this is equity. There's going to be equity distribution in the long run, but we want to win more than 20% of what's in there. Otherwise, we should be folding. Right. So basically what a hand like deuces is, it's like a boomer bust hand where right. you're going to realize equity that allows you to capture a much larger share, or you're not going to realize equity that's going to uh, make it to where you capture a much smaller share or none at all for the most part, right? Correct. But in a so vacuum like, on average, we think we're going to yeah. win more than 20%, correct? Um, I mean, we, we must, we must. else we, we wouldn't play the hand, right? Cor correct. Shall we call it just for the sake of the conversation, 25%, just for the sake of the conversation? We can, so, but, but I think we're like comparing apples and oranges here because like the equity distribution on the flop is going to be quite different. And then there's bets placed on the flop that are, in, that are independent of the pre-flop action. Co correct. But I mean, when people are actually like calculating, for example, profitability from the button, it always comes as a percentage of the blinds, right? I mean, you know, like 0.6 of the blinds on the button or like say 0 0.4, uh, 0.4 blinds on average per hand or something like that, right? So what I want to, to, to put here is that out of the pie, which is one, we're going to win a percentage of that in the long run, right? That's, that's how EV calculations are being made, right? So, okay. we're gonna, so, so, we agree that we, it's going to be more than 20%. Otherwise, we wouldn't be involved. I'm not sure. I, I think that it could be 1%, but there could be a whale in the hand that gives us um, 500x our preflop investment, and therefore, we can still call with a smaller share. So I, I don't really see the... I mean, in the average, on the average, like if we do that a thousand times, like on average, we'll get a quarter of that pie every time on average. If we do that a thousand times or a million times or a billion times, that's, that's what I'm getting. Sure. Yeah, sure. We, we agree with that. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, so uh, I actually don't look at it as like a, uh, it doesn't matter. I don't look at it as a percentage of the pie. I look at it as um, the return on your investment downstream based on lots of different flops, lots of different betting, lots of different sure. base being pl placed. And then the equity distribution amongst all those future bets being placed um, have a dramatic impact uh, more so to the profit profitability of limping than the initial limp itself. And, 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 and you're not wrong. Like this is, this is very important. We have to take into account what I'm trying to do here. I'm not trying to oversimplify. I'm trying to see the big picture first. Sure. So, so what I'm trying to, to say, and, and there's going to be nuance in what I'm saying, it's not a perfect argument, but what I'm yeah. saying is if on average we win 25% of a certain pie, wouldn't we rather have a bigger initiative, it, it, excuse me, a bigger initial investment, my apologies. Freudian slip there. Freudian yeah. slip there, exactly. <laughs> right. So um, um, wouldn't be better. So instead of just basically having one blind, so when we 25% uh, of that uh, is going to be 1.25 blinds. So we put one blind in, we get 1.25. Wouldn't it be better to have, let's say, whatever, like five blinds or like six blinds, six times five, six times five or six times four, whatever, we, and then we get 25% of that. So um, basically, we, we get six die. Uh, we get uh, six blinds in, and then we get seven point five out, okay. which is 
right? So instead of getting a quarter of a blind buck, we get a, uh, you know, a buck 50 or whatever, whatever the, the calculation comes out to be. Right. And the reason why I think it's an oversimplification is that, you know, we're playing no limit Texas Hold'em where you can bet any amount on any street and like just a, a hand like deuces in a limp pot, like you can stack somebody. It's not like I actually reviewed multiple hands this week um, where somebody got stacked uh, after like limping, right? Like in a limp, like small blind completes first big blind and five way flop and um, you know, the wolf stacks stack somebody like with with value so so i think like yeah i mean i see i see what you're saying and i understand what you're saying um there's an oversimplification for another reason too like uh, to show you that i understand the nuance here it's important yeah it's an oversimplification because the ranges when we over limp uh, and we see the flop are completely different than the ranges when we raise and get and then so many calls the, yes, the, correct. the ranges change absolutely so i'm aware yeah. of all of that however yeah. there is something to be said about growing the pot if you can actually keep the percentage that you get back at least at the similar levels. For example, if we overlimp and we win 25% on average, that could be at least you know, uh, as good as if we, let's say, raise to six blinds and we get cold and we can get 22% back, which is something that I would argue it, 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 it can happen. And of course, you have access to databases, which I also wanted to address. I think this is very, very important. Your access to databases got me thinking a lot, actually. It's like one of those things. And actually, other people have said that too, you know, situations, you know, limping nine, nine, 10 suited under the gun and things like that, which for me, it's like, a, I'd rather fold that hand than actually, you know, limp from under the gun, like uh, uh, nine, nine, 10 suited, like playing out of- But why, spot. right? Like, yeah. I guess that's like a, that's a, that, that, that that's a question too of like, you know, there are some three blind games with Annie's that have different structure where like limping is actually incentivized right. um, because of the structure of the game. So like, if you can do something that makes money that you don't normally do, then shouldn't you just do it? No, oh, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the game, of course, right? I mean, when I say right. I'd rather fold it, I mean, in a vacuum in certain situations. And you're right. I mean, once again, I don't mean to oversimplify. I'm saying in most scenarios under, under, many circumstances but you're right if there's certain situations and, and i've done it but it's not like i haven't done it i'm just sure it's one yeah. of those things where being a little bit hyperbolic to be fair but you, you you're right you're absolutely correct the, th the thing that i wanted to, to mention about uh the the database is uh, this is a fun fact actually do you know which is like somebody did a, uh an analysis on uh like i believe i put it on the on, on the on my book i have it i have that chart on my book and we're talking about each hand was played you know, like in, in the order of uh, a quarter of a million times or like a quarter to a half a million times, each hand, each separate hand. Do you know which hand had the lowest return, negative return? Obviously, I mean, you would expect aces to have the biggest uh, return per hand then the kings, queens, you know, ace, king suited, stuff like that. And then hands were, they were trying to rank hands by profitability, how many blinds per hand this type of, of holding can make on average. Do you know which hand ranked at the very end? And this is an impossible question to, to possibly yeah, I, answer I would, correctly I, but uh, i would say too that like a lot of this hinges on the person playing said hands i, um, I agree with you i agree so like and, and, that, that that's what makes it like just pretty impossible but if you were uh, to make a guess would you say it's a hand like seven deuce type would you say it's a hand like a three deuce type would you say it's a no hand i would like say it's probably an offsuit broadway beautiful. queen jack off or something yeah, like I, I like the way you're thinking. I like the way you're thinking. That that goes to show you that you know again you understand the concept of uh, that sounds incredibly condescending, and I apologize didn't mean that that way. So, but it, it, for the listener, this show yes, I, I want to make that point. This is uh, the concept of reciprocality, right? I mean, it's so intuitive, you know, for for people who play this game. Immediately, they're going to go into one of those tough hands, and that's exactly what happened. It did. It wasn't Queen Jack offsuit, but it doesn't matter. You got the hand. The, the, you got the idea right it was the hand ace deuce offsuit. So ace deuce offsuit was actually losing um, 0.15 blinds per hand. So mm -hmm. people actually were losing more hand, more money with ace deuce than they were losing money with seven deuce. Why is yeah, that? Because it's a hand that you can V-pip and not fold. And exactly, they were over. Just, it. just by V-pipping it, you're gonna lose more than um, folding it. Exactly, and, and this is something that like, I, 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 wanted, I wanted to mention. I, I truly believe uh, that it is possible, and I'm, I'm not saying that this is the case, and, and again, databases are very strong, right? I'm not, I'm not going against databases, but I'm saying, like you said, it depends who's playing the, 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 the hand, um, but 
it is possible that those databases don't account for the fact that actually raising their reduces makes the hand much harder to play, which means people who raise with it tend to make more mistakes than those who limp. This is just something for people to ponder. So it, sure. uh, it, it is possible, right? And again, I'm, I'm not trying to-, to, to No, no, I, I see what you're saying. It, it, it is possible and there's no way to prove it. And so right. at, at the end of the day, it doesn't, it, we're just like, you know, spitting into the wind because like, we, we can't prove it one way or the other, right? Co correct. The reason why I'm talking about pies and I'm making everybody hungry and I apologize for that also <laughs> is because like I'm trying to find some, since again, I mean, I only have my, my sample of, you know, my close friends essential and myself, you know, like, yeah, uh, uh, sure. you know, and our win rates, uh, the, uh, I, I sort of like, you know, trying to find, but I tried to find a theoretical idea. And then one of the theoretical ideas of, I found that I also use in the book is that, you know, 25% of, let's say, five blinds uh, can be, you know, worse than, let's say, 22% of like 30 blinds, because again, we make more profit. Uh, so even if our return on the pie sort of like is reduced, just because everybody put more money in the middle, plus some dead money that we're going to have, then that actually um, uh, makes us be more profitable, of course. And now that's the nuance. And that's the point that you made earlier. We have to take into account everything else, the texture, the tendencies, you know, which, which hands to bluff, which hands to not bluff, and so which, which boards to see bad, which boards to not see bad, and all of these things. Sure. I agree. Am I here? No, no, absolutely. 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 <laughs> We're just, uh, stare, staring off in his face. No, no, no. I'm just, uh, uh, yeah. I, um, so how, like for the listener, uh, one of my favorite things to do is uh, why don't we uh, attempt to steal men uh, each other's position so that people can see, you know, where that, you know, that, that uh, disagreement compatibility. And uh, you can start, I can start whatever you want to do. You, you can start. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, so Brad is making a very important point here. And uh, the point that Brad is making is that we have to be careful when we're talking about uh, concepts which are intrinsic and concepts which are, which are not intrinsic. Uh, meaning that uh, if we really care about solving the game and nothing else, there's certain information uh, which is not going to be essential. And one of that information that is not essential is the concept of betting, uh, the concept of initiative of having the last bet. Uh, the idea being is that uh, we decide a strategy based on whether we think is the most profitable play and nothing else. So if we find that a certain situation is the most profitable play, we don't care if our opponents bet before the flop. We don't care if our opponents, you know, have what people call the initiative. We really don't care if they bet a lot or little. All that matters is to understand exactly the decision tree and act uh, and, 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 and act accordingly. Yeah. Um, is, is that a fair? Is, is that a fair representation of, of your view? I think so. I think it's fair. Okay. okay. Um, and for, for Duncan's side, you know, Duncan believes that uh, rec players or uh, players that inhabit the live streets um, generally don't generally don't take aggressive preflop actions specifically related to the deuce's hand that allow us to overrealize equity. Um, and using initiative against players who tend to overfold, um, just tends to work out well in general. So when you don't have a hand and you have the option to bet first, then initiative is going to matter a lot for dual reasons. Number one, your opponent doesn't get to bet before you. And number two, uh, villains just overfold, right? Exactly. Yep. I think that's, uh, that's, that's very good. And, and in terms of like, you know, that, that, that compatibility, uh, I think we can, we can see where the compatibility lies into Again, depending on whether we're thinking about uh, GTO HAL and exploitable HAL, because it, it's visible that uh, as a heuristic, uh, initiative plays different roles in those two situations, I would say. 
as a as a heuristic as a heuristic yes it's 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 a fairly bad heuristic in the first case but it it, it could potentially be a, a very good heuristic in the second case and okay. I, I i underline potentially because again the the, the you know the the verdict is uh, what's what's the word is still out there <laughs> <laughs> the verdict's out there but we're yeah, well, I guess we'll we'll see what what's said after this week's episode of of uh, Philosophical Friday and the initiative debate that well, I, I think it's going to die today, um, but maybe go on in the village. Um, yeah, it's been. I, I do enjoy it. I, I think in a lot of cases it can feel like we're wrestling with semantics, especially on a topic like this, but I, it's always important to me to crack open um, sort of every piece and understand, better understand what's going on, um, why we feel one way or the other, why we disagree one way or the other, uh, these sort of like intuitive feelings, just breaking them apart, figuring, finding the difference. And then ultimately, I think that both of us probably understand what we're talking about much better just because we broke things apart and dove in deep um, and hopefully for the listener, that will be the case as well. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I have for this episode of Philosophical Friday. Excellent. I, I do have one last question for you, which is kind of like a, a little bit meta. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you think, uh, and you can just say yes or no, you can go into it, you can do anything you want, obviously it's Philosophical Friday. Uh, do you think there is, it's possible for different approaches to be successful in poker of course it, it, it must be the case because there are lots of different approaches and lots of people are successful and so like it, it must be the case that there's not one um only one path to making money playing poker right and and, and i and i you know it's, it's implied in that question also like different strategies potentially of course mm -hmm. of course there there's strategic different i mean the, the reality is we're all human beings and even even amongst you know in my cfp the, the wolf program like we have very specific protocols in a lot of different spots and yet the individual players still have different internal strategies different intuitive strategies in different situations um that they deploy and, and like you can see that in differences in like people's graphs right like some people's graphs look one way some people's graphs look another and it's just uh basically a mirror of how they approach the game strategically. And as human beings, we all have different strategies. Um, the game is too big to, for, you know, any two people to really have two exact strategies. Well said. I mean, I couldn't say it better myself. I mean, we, we happen to perfectly agree on that one. So yeah, <laughs> well, if there's two theory. people in the world that win at poker, then yes, you can have different strategies and, and right. win because those two players, 1000 million percent don't have the same strategy. Yeah, that's 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 very relevant because it's it's another thing to 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 consider. So, perhaps as it is relevant to our conversation, perhaps there is at least in part some of that. You know, like uh, sure, that is like some a, a different approach that actually works for in for 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 the individual. And this is also something that I make very clear in the book. Part of the reason, actually, why I didn't want to suggest any strategies until my wife said and said, Duncan, you're going to write an entire book w without suggesting a strategy or without like, yeah, because I think that people will have different approaches to the game. But, you know, I did it anyway. Yeah. But anyway. All right, man. Yeah. Good stuff. And uh, we'll be right back at it next Absolutely. week. Check us out. Greatnessvillage.com. Why Alex Beats Bobby on YouTube. And the Twitters of the world. And the Twitters. Always check out the Twitters. Always. Bye, everybody. Take care.